Alan Wake 2 is, at its core, a story about control. No, not that control, though I do think that game's story was about the theme of control also, of a slightly different variety. Alan Wake 2 is a story about characters trying to seize control of their own choices, their own lives, their own destinies. Characters struggling against the story they exist in itself. Alan Wake, the character, is trying to understand the story he himself wrote, to rewrite its ending and, in the process, rewrite his life, his family, the whole world. And in that way, this is also a story about the art of storytelling. On the other side of things, Saga Anderson is struggling against a story that has killed her daughter. She did not choose to be a part of this story. In many ways, it chose her, and she wants out. Minor characters like Alex Casey, the Koskala brothers, Sheriff Breaker, Tom Zane, and Alice Wake are all essentially also trying to take control of a situation that's way beyond any of them. They are all caught up in a story written by someone else. That's why Alice Wake becomes a obsessed with this art project, with photographing this spirit of her dead husband that is haunting her. Alice actually says so herself pretty explicitly. In this scene, she says, I thought I could contain Alan in my photos, but I can't. I can't, I can't. If you contain something, then you are in control of it. But she cannot control this. In this scene, we're seeing a character who has lost all control. And that loss of control has broken her, devastated her. People can survive a lot of hardship but few people can survive feeling like they have absolutely no control over their lives. You might be able to endure that physically, but spiritually, it will tear you up inside, in exactly the way it's done to Alice here. So, Alan Wake 2 is meta-horror, which means it is a horror story that knows it is a horror story. Aware of its own tropes, the characters, at least to some extent, know that they are characters in a horror story, and that knowledge shapes the decisions they make. There are moments in this game when the characters say some version of, because this is a horror story, that means we have to do this, we have to behave that way. Our choices have to match the genre of story we are trapped within. That's why the ending has to play out the way it does. It has to be violent. Someone has to be killed. But we are getting a little ahead of ourselves here. I believe that most horror stories are actually about the theme of control, not just this one. I suspect that lack of control is the true essence of horror. These stories resonate with us because loss of control is a fear that literally all humans everywhere share. And there is no more visceral, more extreme example of loss of control than being stalked, being hunted, being captured, being murdered. If someone kills you, they are, in some sense, taking control of your life taking control of your entire future. So let's start our analysis with Saga Anderson's side of the story, because hers is much more straightforward and easier to understand than Alan's. His story is a big, confusing, convoluted, looping, spiraling nightmare, but we'll unravel it the best we can later in the video. First, Saga Anderson. Okay, so at the start of her story, Saga is a character who is in total control of the situation. She is an FBI agent, a figure of federal authority. And more than that, she's the one in charge of the case. Her partner, Agent Alex Casey, very explicitly hands control of the case over to her at the start of the game. Moreover, Saga is a brilliant detective, with what appears to be a supernatural ability to detect the hidden motives and even secrets of others, to see things that no one else can. She very quickly begins making progress on this murder case, finding clues, making connections. Now, I want to fast forward to the exact moment in this story when she loses that control, and it does not happen when you might expect. You might think that the moment she loses control occurs down here in the morgue, when, out of nowhere, the sheriff vanishes into thin air in front of her eyes, and then this dead body comes to life, and the story dramatically transitions from what had been a fairly straightforward murder mystery and becomes a bizarre supernatural psychological thriller. But no, that's not it. The moment comes a little bit earlier, and it's much quieter and subtler than what happens at the morgue. We're gonna watch it together, and as you watch, see if you can find it. Try to pinpoint the exact second when the story takes control away from her. Here it is. Thanks. This could prove to be helpful. Do me a favor. Stick around town for now in case we have any more questions. <laughs> like we'd even dream of missing dear Oh, God. Saga! Saga 
Anderson as I live and breathe. I thought we'd never see you back here after that awful, awful thing happened to your baby girl. How are you? Um, I'm sorry. Who are you? I don't know what you're talking about. It's me, silly. Rose. You know me. I don't think I do. And what horrible thing happened to my baby girl? She drowned. Your daughter. That's so weird, you don't remember. How do you know I have a daughter? Oh, I know what this is. You're blocking out your traumatic memories. Happens on TV all the time. No. You're mistaking me for someone else. <laughs> if you say so. I think it happens when Rose, the waitress, recognizes her. Up until that moment, Saga's life was on track. She knew who she was. She knew her history. She knew exactly where her family was. But then Rose recognizes her. And now everything is already a mess. Because Rose should not recognize her. They've never met. Saga has never been here before. By rewriting Rose's memories, the story is beginning to take control of Saga's past, of her family. You can can hear in Saga's dialogue her attempts to reassert control. No, you're wrong. My daughter isn't dead. Which is really her saying, no, my life is still defined by my choices, not by some story written by someone else. Except she's wrong. She is a character in a story. She always has been. Actually, a character in a story inside another story, and even inside another story in that story, if you want to get really specific about it. Her life was written for her by the writers of Alan Wake 2 the video game. She had control because the writers of this game wrote her to have control. That's the confusing nature of metafiction. Stories within stories within stories. And now her story has been rewritten, and she's going to spend the rest of the game fighting to write it back the way it used to be. For a time, it seems as if the story may just be rewriting memories. Maybe it's just rewritten Rose and the other townspeople's memories to trick them into believing that Saga's daughter died here, without her daughter actually physically dying in the real world. But that is not the case. The story is rewriting physical reality too, which she discovers when she visits her supposed home, and there finds her daughter's bedroom, filled with her daughter's actual belongings, objects and and letters and photos that match Saga's memory of who her daughter was. I want to watch another scene together, the scene where Saga realizes just how much of her life has been rewritten. And as you watch, I want you to think about this scene in the context of a horror story. This is a horrific scene. There is something frightening in here. But it's not a monster or a murderer or anything like that. It's a different kind of horror. All right, here it is. No. It's, it's not true. It's just a story. It's not true. Logan's back home. She's fine. Hey, this is David. Leave a message. David? Is Logan okay? Call me back as soon- Mulligan? Hey! Stay where you are! Okay, so the horror here is a loss of control. The horror stems from the story itself, from being trapped inside a story that is deciding your life for you, and not just your life, 
but the lives of those you love, existing in a story where, at the mere stroke of a keyboard, the whim of some distant, uncaring author, the lives of people you care about can be destroyed in an instant. Your child can be killed for no reason other than to fit a narrative theme, to match the tropes of the genre, to meet the expectations of the audience. That is horror. And you can hear it in the panic in Saga's voice. That's the same kind of panic you might hear from a character who's just realized that the killer is already inside the house, that they are no longer safe. Saga attempts to reassert control by calling her husband, by making sure that her remembered version of reality is the correct one, and notice the way the story very deliberately and obviously distracts her, how it pulls her away, drags her back down into the convoluted plot threads. When she sees the taken police officer, she stops what she was doing, plunges deeper into the currents of the story, gets lost in them for the next several hours. She tries to reassert control again later, but each time, she only falls deeper and deeper into the confused plot lines of the story. She tries to rescue Alan Wake from the dark place so he can fix this mess he's made, but this actually just sets the whole terrible story into motion. Because when she summons Alan, she actually summons the dark presence which has consumed him. She is the one who revived the nightmare. She's trying to stop the story, but instead her decisions are exactly what makes the story come true in the first place. So what is the solution here? How can a character overcome the story they're in? How can a character overcome their reality? It feels impossible. And towards the end of the game, after she has failed over and over again, and she can't withstand any more failure, Saga not only loses control of the story, but she loses control of herself too. Of her fears, her anxieties, her doubts. She lets those negative feelings overwhelm her. And I want to watch that scene too, and in this scene, Saga will also find a way to finally take back control. Here it is. No matter what I do, someone will get hurt. I don't know what to do. I'm afraid. I'm my own worst enemy. The fears in my head are stopping me from trying. From leaving. I can't, I can't, I can't. I just, I just want it to stop. Giving up won't make this stop. Logan needs me. Casey needs me. I've made mistakes. I'll make more. But I can do better. And I can start by leaving this room. I'm afraid it will hurt. But nothing will hurt more than not trying to save them. It will hurt. But I will fight. It's a common truism that you cannot control what other people do, but you can control what you do, your choices, how you react and respond to what's happening around you. This is what Saga must realize in order to take control back from the story. The first step is to control herself. She has to wrangle her anxieties and fears and doubts into submission. And the way to do that is by confronting them head on, openly, honestly. For the entire story up to this point, she's been ignoring her doubts, just kept charging ahead instead of facing them. She has not confronted her fear over whether her daughter might actually be dead. And if so, her fear that her daughter's death might be her fault. Instead, she just keeps saying, no, my daughter's not dead, over and over again, as if saying so will make it true. Even if those fears aren't rational, they need to be confronted. Otherwise, they'll be left to metastasize inside her, to fester, to rot her psyche from the inside out, in exactly the way that it is done. Finally, here at the end, in this scene, she realizes that she needs to confront those fears first. And in doing so, she can get control of herself. And now that she's in control of herself, she can figure out how to get some control control over her situation. It's very important to note, though, that we never learn whether her attempts to reassert control are successful, but I will discuss the ending more at the end of the video. What I want to do now is to follow Alan Wake's story, where as Saga begins the story in a state of control, Alan begins the story in a state of total chaos, which at first does not make sense. If anyone has control over the story, it should be Alan. He's the one who wrote the story, but instead, it feels like he's just getting dragged around in circles by that story. 
I do wonder if this could be some kind of commentary on how little control creators actually have over the things they create. I've often heard writers talk about how characters and scenes seem to come to life as they're being written. That writing is a process of discovery rather than a process of planning. That eventually, once the story has established itself, you have to write the story where it needs to go rather than wherever you might want it to go to satisfy the story and not yourself. Whenever a writer starts writing a story, they will have some vision in their head of what the story should look like, and then whenever they finish, they'll find that the story has become something very different in the telling of it than whatever they had first imagined. The more you write, the more you'll discover that it's impossible to ever match that vision in your head. You cannot predict what the story will ultimately become at any point during the writing process. It's always a surprise. That explains what's going on on here with Alan's relationship to his own story. He has as much control as any writer ever does over their writing. Artistic creation can feel a lot like getting dragged around by a supernatural force which you can't fully understand. The gameplay of Alan Wake 2 has actually replicated the creative process in a really fascinating way. I want to talk a little bit about the musical section here. I think most people see that and they just think, oh wow, this story is so wacky, so crazy. But there is meaning within that rock opera. It has a narrative reason to exist. Let's watch a very short clip, and as you listen, I want you to pay really close attention to what Alan says right before the musical starts. See if you can hear anything familiar. Here it is. I was back, and I hadn't no, forgotten. I, I knew how this worked now. I could take Where control, from, no more surprises. What, the what the hell? From what I've gathered, you grew up nice and sheltered With mama's pretty stories and your own made up fury And mama gave me a magic clicker Well yes, I think it's true and fair to say Alan literally says, I knew how it worked now, I could take control. And then to demonstrate to him just how little control he has, the story throws something so unexpected, so bizarre, so absurd, to show him who's really in control here. That's right, the entire rock opera is really about control too, just like everything else in this story. Alan's storyline is one big loop, or actually a bunch of little loops inside of one big loop. You can see it for yourself. In this final scene, Alan is shot in the forehead with a glowing bullet. And then in the very first scene in the game, Alan is being slow motion shot in the forehead by that same bullet. He even says, back to the beginning again. Every time he wakes up in the studio, he starts by frantically touching his forehead, as if to check if the bullet hole is still there. Somehow, by whatever supernatural, inexplicable power of the dark place, every time he's shot here, he does not die. Instead, he starts over, reliving the same story again and again. I'm not going to bother to even try to find an in-universe explanation for this convoluted plotline, but I think I can find a thematic reason for it, a writing reason. And once again, it has to do with the art of storytelling. Because the experience of writing a story is very similar to the experience of being trapped in a seemingly endless loop. A common saying among writers is that writing is revising, meaning that real writing doesn't begin until you begin revising. That the first draft is nothing, meaningless. All that matters are your revisions. That's where the true story emerges, where meaning and quality emerge. The way revising works is that you just keep going back to the beginning of the story and starting over again. Questioning everything, doing everything over, every single sentence. You do it ten times, a hundred times, forever if you have to. However many revisions it takes to get the story right. And that's exactly what Alan is doing in this game. Once again, the gameplay of Alan Wake 2 is replicating the creative process. You, the player, are experiencing the endless looping feeling of revisions the same way a writer might. It's kind of totally brilliant. I've never seen the creative process portrayed in this way before. Except, as Alan says at the end of the game, It's not a loop. It's a spiral.
Okay, so what the heck does that mean? Well, very simply, a loop is a closed circle. It always circles back to the exact same place it started. A spiral, on the other hand, moves either up or down as it circles. A spiral is going somewhere, leading to someplace new, which, once again, matches the creative process. As a writer, when you're stuck in the muddy trenches of revision number 55, it can certainly feel like you are trapped in an endless loop of revisions that are never going to lead anywhere. But that is not true. Eventually, those revisions revisions are going to lead to the completion of the story. The suggestion here is that, eventually, you know, maybe in another 13 years, the story of Alan Wake is going to be finished too. These loops are not just loops, they are leading somewhere. But let's rewind here a bit. In my analysis of Saga's storyline, I started with the exact moment in the story when she lost control. I want to do the same thing for Alan. His moment of lost control occurs much later in the story than Saga's. Or, I guess because it's all a big loop, you could say that it happens right at the beginning of the story or in the middle, or anywhere else, but whatever. Whenever it happens in the timeline, we're gonna watch the scene where it occurs together. Here it is. I had seen this before. This was not Scratch. This was me. Caught in a loop. I had stopped myself trying to fix the manuscript. I was the one haunting Alice. It was always me. I killed her. I don't think it's until he learns of his wife's supposed suicide that Alan truly loses control. Of course, it's pretty obvious from those pictures that she actually leaped into Cauldron Lake, and thus into the dark place, the same place he is trapped in. But I think we can forgive him for not thinking straight here. Worse, he believes that he himself is responsible for her death. Each time he enters the dark place version of his apartment, these cameras flash. These cameras were set up by Alice in the real world to capture the image of Alan, whose spirit is somehow bleeding into the real world in this spot. In his constant loops, Alan keeps going back to the apartment. We watch him return there over and over again, and each time, apparently, his wife can feel it, sense it, see him. He is literally a ghost haunting her, and we the player participate in this haunting. We bring Alan here again and again. It drives her crazy. She becomes becomes obsessed with trying to control this haunting through her art, and when that doesn't work, she tries something more drastic. She leaps into Cauldron Lake. Believing her dead, it's in his rage and despair that Alan allows the dark presence to control him, that he transforms into his villainous double, Mr. Scratch. I think the way the dark presence and Mr. Scratch are depicted has changed between games. In the first game, the dark presence behaved like a pretty standard horror story villain. It was essentially an evil monster or supernatural malevolent entity that manipulated and destroyed people in its quest for escape. In Alan Wake's American Nightmare, Mr. Scratch behaves like the standard evil twin trope, a bad guy version of Alan. In Alan Wake 2, the writers have made some changes. The Dark Presence barely ever appears on screen, and when it does, it doesn't seem to behave intelligently. It does not seem as if it is making plans and schemes, cleverly manipulating others into doing its bidding the way it used to. Instead, now it's more like hatred and violence incarnate. In this scene, I think it's less that Alan is possessed by the Dark Presence, and more like he becomes the Dark Presence. Through his hatred and rage, he becomes the monster. In a similar way, Mr. Scratch is no longer depicted as an actual separate entity with his own will, his own personality, his own goals. Instead, Mr. Scratch is Alan Wake. He is Alan having a bad day. Alan giving himself over to his worst vices and impulses. Giving into his anger, his hatred, and his depression. Just like in Saga's side of the story, control over oneself is essential. It's when 
when Alan loses control over himself and his emotions that he actually loses total control over the story too, when it becomes this nightmare. But remember, this story is one big loop. So even though it's not until now that Alan loses control, we experience that nightmare from the very beginning of the game. Because things that happen in the future of a loop actually happen in the past too, and vice versa. Anyway, after losing control of himself, Alan writes a twisted and evil new story titled Return, a story with the potential to change the entire world. We actually see what kind of world he would create at the end of the game. And it's not quite as nightmarish as you might expect, it's actually a little goofy. At the end of the game, we explore a reality in which everyone is obsessed with Alan Wake's novels. Everyone talks about him, praises him, a world where he is essentially a god and his novels a new religious text. I think this world makes a lot of sense. Alan Wake is a writer, and so of course he's going to create a world where he gets the thing that writers want most. And what do writers want? Well, they want most of all to be read. They want their writing to be appreciated, complimented, praised. And that's exactly what we see here. A world where Alan Wake's novel is appreciated, complimented, and praised. Endlessly. Infinitely. Alright, moving on. So when, if ever, does Alan manage to reassert control over his own story? Let's watch the scene where it happens. Here it is. Something felt different. I'd never seen myself in a vision before, but it fit. Saga and I were both at the center of this story. She was now my co-author. This was the beginning of the end. We were characters in a horror story, charging blindly towards the finale. We still didn't have everything we needed. This would not work without the clicker. This is Alan regaining control of his story. And how does he do it? Well, of course he does it through revision. The process of revision is how writers take control of their stories. When a story has gotten too big, too bloated, too complicated, too convoluted, become something you don't want it to be, become unmanageable, a writer can fix it through revision by cutting and adding, by changing the conclusion. Once again, the storyline of Alan Wake 2 is replicating the writing process. And it's really important that he only manages this revision with Saga's help. Writers are often depicted as lonely people, solitary, locked in a room by themselves, tapping away at their keyboard. But that is not how successful writing usually works. All writers know the value of editors, of peers, of friends willing to read your work of having a community of fellow writers who can provide feedback and criticism. Most truly great stories were not written by one writer alone. Most of them were written with the assistance of an entire community of people in the background. Writing is a communal process, which is reflected in Alan and Saga having to work together to come up with the right ending to the story. Finally, we need to talk about that ending. I've seen a lot of people describe this game's ending as unsatisfying. It's pretty clearly meant to be the second part in a trilogy, so it can seem as if none of the major plot threads have been decisively concluded. For example, we never find out if Saga actually saved her daughter's life, and Alan Wake is still trapped inside the dark place, and not just him, but like a dozen other people too. Alice Wake, Saga Anderson, Tor and Odin Anderson, Alex Casey, Sheriff Breaker, Tom Zane, Warlin Dorr. The population of the Dark Place has quadrupled in this game, and none of these characters have any obvious means of escape. Alan may have realized that it isn't a loop but a spiral, but he is seemingly nowhere near the end of that spiral at the end of this game. So I can understand why people would be dissatisfied. However, I think more has been concluded here than a lot of people realize. Okay, so the two major themes of this game were, as you already know since you watched the entire video, control and storytelling. Telling. Saga Anderson may or may not have taken control of the story, but she did regain control of herself, of her anxieties and her doubts. Alan Wake did the same. He reasserted control over his own emotions, his depression, his anger. That theme of control has been concluded in a very intimate way. Next to the theme of storytelling. Alan and Saga have stopped this version of the story from coming true. The version where Alan becomes some sort of twisted dark god, ruling over an earth which worships his novels. And 
they accomplished this through the act of communal revision, which is strong medicine to the disease of a story out of control. So that theme is concluded too. Again, there is more conclusion here than is perhaps immediately obvious. It will be up to Alan Wake 3 to fulfill this conclusion. For these characters to take this growth, what they've realized about self-control and revision, and carry it forward into the next story. Alan Wake ended with the line, it's not a lake, it's an ocean. Well, in Alan Wake 2, I think we have thoroughly plumbed the depths of that ocean. The story of the ocean is concluded. Now it's time for the story of the spiral, which should explore entirely different themes, and arrive at a totally different kind of conclusion. And I really hope it comes a little quicker this time around.